outside of your interview. And then at 3 or 3.30, uh, the entire group of students who are here for preview day will reconvene, um, I believe, in the quad, or maybe it's out here in Cruz Plaza, for punch and, and some socializing. All right. Uh, let me start with a round of applause for our panelists and our advisory board members. I think that was a real treat. You got to hear some, some unvarnished and honest opinions, and we did not dumb it down for you. Uh, and, and I found it fascinating. Hopefully you did too. So this, this weekend, as I said earlier, started with the scholarship, but we wanted to do more than a scholarship. We wanted to bring people like our panelists. We wanted to bring professionals and have, give you a sense of why we're still passionate about this field and, and what the opportunities are and, and how it would serve you well to think differently and not maybe the way you've traditionally thought of journalism because there are a lot of high school students who get to college and they're still thinking you know, traditionally, which is, surprises a lot of people. Uh, but apply the things you actually do the, with, with your phone, with the tweeters and such. Uh, start thinking about how that impacts sharing information with the public. But we also wanted to recognize a professional uh, who's done outstanding work. And, and we started talking with the Knight Foundation, who, who funds us overall. Uh, and we talked with Beverly Blake, who's in the back. Thanks to Beverly for funding, not leading the effort to fund not just this whole collaboration, but for specific events like this that, that give you, a, a, you and our students a real treat. So what we want to do is really reward a professional who's done some unique things in the industry and who's pushed it forward, who, who would be exciting and engaging to you guys. And we debated long and hard through all kinds of names up on the whiteboard from Mark Cuban to the former CTO of the United States under Barack Obama, uh, just a wide variety of names. And fairly quickly, we came to a consensus around Matt Thompson, who, as you've already seen in the panel, is a very dynamic speaker and engaging thinker as well. Matt uh, is now the deputy editor at theatlantic.com, and if you don't follow The Atlantic on Facebook or Twitter, you're missing out. They have, for quite a while, been at the forefront of digital media uh, and, and really doing interesting journalism from, from little, little, little tidbits of, of facts to the really hard-hitting, in-depth stuff. And Matt is just joining them from NPR, though, where he has been for, for a number of years. He was the director of Vertical Initiatives uh, and talked a lot about race, ethnicity, education, global health and development. Started the Code Switch blog. Um, he's also the vice chairman of the board for the Center for Public Integrity, a fantastic organization, and the co-founder of Spark Camp, which gets a, a group of diverse people, not diverse journalists, but diverse people from all sorts of fields together uh, to interact. He was an interim online community manager at the Knight Foundation, a Reynolds Fellow, a Pointer Naughton Fellow for online reporting and writing, a Pointer Advisory Board member, Deputy Web Editor at Minneapolis Star Tribune, uh, and he won the Digital Edge Award from the Newspaper Association of America, uh, their new media federation. So very accomplished already, and we really look forward to where he's going to go with his career and look forward to what he has to say. And so with that, Matt, come on up and I will give you our fancy new award. Thank you all so much, and thank you for this uh, uh, being the advisory board in some ways here. Um, um, I'm going to try to make this work if I can. I do not know how to work a microphone, unfortunately. <laughs> That's thing number one that you should know about me. Um, so, um, I was thinking about what I wanted to, when I was thinking about what I wanted to talk with y'all about today, um, and knowing that there would be a group of budding young journalists um, in the room, the thing that I thought about was that I want to, I want to think about the same things that I am talking about with um, my team, um, many of whom are also budding young journalists um, who are at, um, at a fairly early stage in their careers. And the thing that I've been thinking most about in recent days, um, in recent months and years, in fact, um, has been about discovery. 
a power of discovery um, in journalism. And uh, I will speak, you'll notice, mostly about, mostly from a perspective of someone who's focused on digital journalism, but I think, I think the things that I'm talking about are sort of broadly applicable. But uh, first of all, I am Matt Thompson. Nice to meet you all. And uh, if you have anything to snark at me, you can do it at mtomps on Twitter. Um, um, so let me take you back just a few years ago um, to what some might call the hamster era. I have previously referred to this, this as the eyeballs era. Um, so there was this theory, this conventional wisdom about what the internet wanted from us. Um, what people, okay, now that we know that the trajectory of journalism overall is going from analog platforms to digital platforms, what is it that we want from our media on the internet? And the conventional wisdom was this, what this dog is doing. Right. More. More news. Uh, that the internet really just wanted scraps of information every second. Robert Thompson at the Wall Street Journal said, the scoop has never had more significance to our professional users for, who e for whom even a few minutes or a few seconds are a crucial advantage whose value has in ex increased exponentially. Um, um, <laughs> this was the era of what was dubbed the content farm. Demand media um, <laughs> was sort of the most prominent of the company is known as Content Farms. Um, uh, but it was a whole ecosystem of sites, of media properties that were built around the idea of just more trajectory and volume. Can we put information into the world as quickly and as prolifically as possible? Um, Dean Starkman was the one who, uh, um, in a cover issue of the, a cover story for the Columbia Journalism Review, um, talked about the hamster wheel that journalists and often young journalists were being asked to get on, that they were constantly just in this churn of headlines and headlines scrambling to find the tiniest little scrap of information that they could inject into the internet sphere with the hopes that we, the public, would devour it before moving on to the next scrap. So, things happened. Time advanced. Um, and eventually our understanding of what the internet wanted, um, even five years ago, became a bit more nuanced than merely scoops or merely scraps of new information. Um, uh, especially when there was, one, there was one particular moment when Google changed its algorithm and uh, uh, it, it was this top secret like code name project that was called Panda, um, the algorithm change that that felled the content farms in one blow. And so po folks stopped talking about the hamster wheel. Um, at that time, the thing that a lot of us, a lot of us were interested in um, was context. Um, about, about this time is when I would peg to the beginning of what you might call the explainer era. Um, so at this time, um, a bunch of folks, me included, um, we're all talking about the fact that news, just having a constant buffeting of news, this, this flow, this, this maelstrom, waterfall of headlines and scoops, um, was not only exhausting, but it left you without the ability to understand what was happening in the news. You didn't know you needed the decoder ring to process what was going on in the headlines every day. Um, and so a lot of us were talking about context and the need for explanation, explanatory journalism, explainers. Um, Nick Denton um, of Gawker Media, the guy who started Gawker, um, famously said, when remotely possible, turn news into explanation um, in April of 2010, right around this time. Um, uh, at this time, uh, sites like ProPublica and Mother Jones were sort of the leading indicators. Outfits were starting like the Texas Tribune, um, talking about how do we build more explanatory journalism? How do we build explainers more into our work? And now today, uh, just last year, we're seeing the launch of sites like Vox and the New York Times uh, site The Upshot, all about navigating news, providing context, providing explainers. There are now explainers about explainers. There's like explanatory journalism to tell you how explanatory journalism works. There's like a whole, like, I, I mean, uh, uh, 
why the rise of sites devoted to explanatory journalism is a trend worth cel celebrating. Explaining what's behind the sudden allure of explanatory journalism. These are the headlines that you were seeing last year in the news. So the message about context was sort of gotten. The word was out. Explanation was hot. Um, so what that created, and where in some respects we sit today, um, is in this universe. So this is Ezra Klein, um, who created, left the Washington Post where he had led the very popular wonk blog to create Vox.com, which is one of the fastest rising sites in the new media ecosystem. Um, Ezra, uh, a very creative and innovative inventor of story formats, um, is probably best credited for the invention of the chart, the in-charts format. He started here um, in 2009. Um, this was the very first your blank in charts post that I could find. This convention would develop a little bit further, your world in charts, your healthcare system in graphics. That's June 2009. And finally, he settled on this convention, the public's incoherence on spending and spending cuts in one graph. In one graph. What a compelling promise. How many of you have seen a headline anywhere on the internet that says blank in one chart? That is thanks to Ezra Klein. Um, state and local job losses in one chart. Um, it spread beyond Vox, beyond Wonk Blog to the rest of the media. Recent history in one chart. All the anime shows airing in spring 2015 in one chart. The crazy amount of calories Americans eat during the Super Bowl in one chart. Um, not, neither of the two companies that I've worked for in the past five years were immune from this. There was NPR, 32 ways of looking at unemployment in one chart. The Atlantic, the upgrade gap, Apple's new iOS problem in one chart. This was the promise of the concise, focused explainer. It sold this promise. If you look at this one mirror graphic, you will understand this big, complicated system. You will understand all of the anime shows airing in spring 2015. Um, <laughs> we actually, uh, the, the Atlantic actually did a story called The Rise of One Chart in One Chart. Um, <laughs> in 2013, which was, which was pretty great. Um, it's just recursive at this point. This is how the media works, kids. You just find a story format and you take it to heaven. You just go as long as, long as you can with it. Um, um, I did a Google Trends search for In One Chart, and there it is, 2010. Um, uh, it's beginning of its, uh, its march into prominence in the media scape. Um, what this, I think, reflects in some respect is that explanation, context, has been weaponized. Um, that now, this basic understanding that you will come and there will be a lot of headlines promising that this is the thing you need to read to understand this complex phenomenon in the world, now that's the thing that we have a grand supply of, which is actually great. I don't argue that this is a bad thing. But our understanding of what the internet wants today is now know everything. Um, when I talk to my, uh, to the young journalists that I work with, it feels like there's this expectation that you would just, when news breaks now, you just know who's going to write the first truly authoritative explainer. You have to be omniscient. You have to instantly be able to explain everything to everyone. That's the sense that we've begun to expect of our journalists. You just have to know everything, um, which I think that is the weaponization of context, and that's a difficult, a difficult thing to do when you've never reported before. <laughs> um, and also when nobody can possibly know anything. So if we can sort of point ourselves in a different direction, if we can plant some seeds for where it might be possible for journalism to head, um, the thing, the place where I'd want to build on where we are now, again, I think it's important that we have context. It is important now that you have choices for explanation. That when, uh, when something crazy is happening in Yemen, you can go places to figure out what's going on. That's a great place to be. Kudos, internet. We won. Now, the thing, the place where I hope we can get next is to discovery, towards the valuing of discovery. Um, so, how many of you all have heard of Serial, the podcast? 
Good. So it's a, it's a mixed crowd. Some of you all have heard of this thing. Let me just tell you, if you live, if you were a public radio journalist, if you lived in my world, this podcast launched by the This American Life team, helmed by Sarah Koenig last year, um, for about four months took over the conversation about media. Serial was the most, it, it, it is now uh, the most popular podcast of all time, or the most downloaded podcast of all time. Metrics are a little bit wonky. Um, but it was the story, Sarah Koenig's, a uh, 12-episode story investigating the conviction of Adnan Syed for the murder of his high school girlfriend, Heyman Lee. Um, and it unfolded, Sarah Koenig, at the outset, she started the story when she had reported for about a year. She'd known about the case for several years, but she'd been reporting for about a year on whether or not Adnan Syed actually did the murder. And she knew enough to say it's not a clear-cut case. So when she started actually releasing podcast episodes about this, what she said was, I want to get to the bottom of this. Did Adnan Sayed do it? Um, and almost even more importantly, did he get a fair trial? And it was a sensation. A lot of people listened to Serial and downloaded it. Um, and it, so it became sort of a, um, it, 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 Serial, I promise you, is being shown in like, uh, if, if there is another presentation about media happening right now, Serial's probably in it. Um, for it. That's also the way the media works. We love to jump on things together. Um, but uh, one of the interesting things to me about Serial was Sarah Koenig said at the outset of it, I don't know how this is going to end. Um, famously, Funny or Die and Saturday Night Live both before the final episode of Serial did sketches that were like, seriously, Sarah Koenig, you really don't know how this is going to end? You started on this whole thing. There are like five million people watching. Come on, you got to give us something, right? You got, you got an ending, right? Right? Uh, she was like, kind of, no, not really. Um, she didn't know how it was going to end when she started it. She took you along with her on this journey of trying to figure out, was Adnan Syed actually the murderer of Heyman Lee, and did he get a fair trial? And it was arresting, it was super compelling. I think it revealed something which I've long thought, which is that the most of all the things that we can do, we can inform, we can educate, we can anger, we can incite, we can, uh, we can uh, take down, we can investigate, of all the things, of all the tones that journalism is capable of, the thing that is most fascinating when we do it is when we discover. The thing I think that when you see it, when you read it in a story, when you see it on screen, when you follow it, the thing that always grabs you, that always hooks you, is when you find a journalist discovering something. Discovery is the, one of the most powerful things that journalism makes possible. After Sarah Koenig made Serial, after she launched it, and it became something of a sensation, also famously, um, a listener, a set of listeners, took to Reddit and created a serial podcast subreddit, um, which grew to have 44,000 dedicated subscribers, um, but millions of readers every day. Um, every few minutes, like every half hour, someone's posting a new tidbit, a new speculation on this case, a new piece of evidence, a new theory for how the, how the crime might have gone down. Um, that's the world we live in now. People want to discover things alongside us. All of these folks engaged with Sarah Koenig's journey of discovery started their own. They turned it into a whole subreddit. I think, as a matter of fact, as a signal of having done a pretty impressive piece of journalism, someone dedicating a subreddit to your journalism is a pretty good one. I want to do journalism that people dedicate a subreddit to. Most importantly for me as a journalist, one of the things that I valued most about the story was pulling people along with that process of discovery. It made people, it gave them a familiarity with the actual mechanisms of reporting. Sarah Koenig was saying, these are the questions I asked. These are the steps that I took to verify this information. This was, this was how I reported this story. This is what an investigation looks like. All of those folks on that Reddit, on that serial podcast subreddit, we're engaging for almost the first time with the, the kind of messiness of a journalistic investigation of how reporting actually unfolds. Um, and that itself was a significant novelty. And also, in, in a universe where 
each of us as consumers of media, as users of media, as well as makers of media, where it's incumbent on each of us to understand what makes a story real, what makes a story worth trusting, um, to know that we can't really just outsource it any longer to a brand. We can't just say, oh, this comes from BuzzFeed. Of course it's worth trusting. Now that we know that, that leaves us in this rocky place where we have to be able to investigate the journalism itself. We as consumers, when we're reading stories, when we're following them, we have to be able to understand what is it that makes this story credible. And Serial, because of the way it was done, because Sarah pulled all these listeners along with her on that process of discovery, it gave people the tools to be able to do that, to ask, well, what does this journalism, what does the way that we know this journalism was done tell us about what might be right about it and what might be wrong about it? Engage people with questions of journalistic ethics. Um, and because it was such a compelling question, and Sarah Koenig and her team framed that question so compellingly, it spawned this whole other universe of journalism. There were actually podcasts, there were two separate podcasts about the podcast. The Onion, AV Club, produced something called The Serial Serial, where every time the podcast came out, they would discuss it. Slate did the same thing. After the podcast was concluded, the subreddit, which is still going, by the way, um, was uh, when exploded when this uh, when Glenn Greenwald's publication, uh, The Intercept, um, scored an interview with two key characters that had not appeared in the podcast. Um, when I think about the media ecosystem that we are emerging into, this process, Sarah Koenig tells a story so curious, so interesting, it grows so big that everyone is doing something with it. That, to me, looks an awful lot like like a collaborative journalism ecosystem that we want to be, that we want to have in mind. Um, it's, it was actually, Sarah Koenig had nothing to do with the creation of that subreddit. She told this story, it was fascinating to enough people that they made this thing, and now that's the ecosystem that she, as the primary teller of this story, has to live in. She has to think about collaboration. When I think about other stories that got people to discover um, where I watch the process of a reporter discovering something alongside the public, alongside the folks who listen to that story. Um, I like, I think of this, uh, Planet Money. Any of you all, are there any Planet Money listeners in the room? There are a few. Everybody listen to Planet Money, it's amazing right now. Um, um, Planet Money is a podcast about the economy. Um, and they said they've got a devoted following. Um, the fact, um, the fact that they have for years been telling these really interesting stories about the economy and that they do this, they sort of discover in public, they ask interesting questions like, what would it be like if we bet against all the American stock market? Like, what would, we do, what would happen to us if we said we think every stock in America is going to go down? Um, they ask that question and they tell that story. That's how they work. Um, so in this case, they said, hey, folks, we want to do a story about t-shirts. Everyone owns t-shirts, right? We want to go back and report on it. From the very beginning of the harvesting of the cotton, how a t-shirt gets made. We want to go to factories in Bangladesh. We want to go to uh, printers in Colombia. We want to go all over the world to trace the story of one t-shirt. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to ask you to buy the t-shirts. If we get enough people to buy our t-shirts, we can fund this investigation with journalists to go around the world um, to research how your t-shirts get made, how the things that we wear on our bodies get made um, through the world. So they, they, they actually went to Kickstarter and they were hoping for about 20,000, no, 50,000 bucks. 20,000 people donated almost $600,000 um, because of the following that Planet Money had and because they valued the journalism that Planet Money did that much. Um, 20,000 people kicked in um, well, about what you'd pay for an expensive t-shirt. Um, we did not, <laughs> uh, it, the journalists I should mention had like one hand tied behind their back on Kickstarter. They could only raise the, um, you know, usually you're allowed to ask, get, offer a few tears for wealthy folks to say like, you know, if you pay $5,000, we will actually, uh, we will wear your t-shirt ourselves and then send it to you. No, they would, they, 
That was not actually a tier that was possible. We only said you could only do $25 of donations. So with a maximum $25 donation, they got 20,000 people to give them $600,000, and then they went across the world and they reported on what it took to put a t-shirt together. And a lot of people got to watch alongside them as stories unfolded, as they went to factories, um, and they spoke to people um, in different parts of the world, in different parts of the t-shirt production industry, and discovered alongside us what it meant to make the clothes that we wear. Uh, at the end of the, uh, the movie that they, they ended up producing, the five-part documentary, um, they have an opportunity for, if you bought the t-shirt, they ask you to tag yourself on Instagram wearing the shirt. And so there's a gallery of the t-shirts being shown from all over the world. Um, people taking selfies with their Planet Money t-shirts on their vacation, um, from outside their living room, et cetera. Um, both of these things, both of these phenomenons, they sort of harken back to um, a slightly earlier era of the web, earlier even than the hamster era. Um, um, about eight years ago, um, a, young, a journalist named Josh Marshall, political journalist, um, started doing this investigation. He was, um, it, he didn't really know it was an investigation at first. He had a couple young reporters working with him and they were just pulling together bits of like lo interesting local news stories uh, that sometimes readers would send them, sometimes they would find in their journeys through the media. And they had noticed that while uh, a U.S. attorney, um, a, a lawyer for the state, um, had been fired, um, had been dismissed from, a, a decorated U.S. attorney had been dismissed from uh, his position. Um, they noticed, just in sort of paying attention to these things, a reader said, hey, you know, I saw that thing about the U.S. attorney getting fired. Funny thing is, my U.S. attorney also just got fired, Carol Lamb. And they asked the question, why were these attorneys fired? in public. They asked this question. Uh, um, they sort of knew enough to know that it's not all that common an occurrence for a spate of U.S. attorneys to be dismissed from their spots, and so they started asking this question. Um, people started sending them instances from their newspapers of questions that local reporters were asking about why their U.S. attorneys were being fired. Ultimately, it snowballed. After a while, it became clear that actually something was going on. This was worthy of a big investigation. A lot of folks jumped on it, and ultimately, the Attorney General for the United States, Alberto Gonzalez, had to resign his position because it turned into a scandal that large. It was a discovery. They had reported enough to know that they had an interesting question, that they had something that they were curious about, and then they dove into it. And Josh Marshall said, you know, I know at a certain point, like it's just me and like my three like, like reporters here on the kind of shoestring budget. At a certain point, big news organizations are going to take this and start running with it, and they did. Um, even though Talking Points Memo and its team won a Polk Award, a George Polk Award, a pres very prestigious prize for the work that they did, lots of news organizations contributed to the reporting that made clear that yes, in fact, untoward things had happened. Um, but we got to watch that and participate with that journey of discovery alongside them. I think, when I think about the Center for Collaborative Journalism, I think about that um, example. I think about Josh Marshall's willingness to say, hey, we've got something really curious here. Join us. Everybody who also doesn't have an answer to these questions, pitch in. We'll figure this out together. Fellow named, I work now with a, a fellow named ta Coates. Has anybody heard of this guy? Um, so the journalists in the room have. I hope um, for those of you who are younger journalists who don't, you know, yet read like things like The Atlantic and whatnot, um, I hope that you will familiarize yourself a little bit with the work of ta Coates. He's a pretty awesome guy. Um, he started at The Atlantic as a blogger, um, a really curious uh, blogger. Um, he um, is most well known right now for having last year done this cover story in the Atlantic. Um, so he wrote a story called The Case for Reparations. 
um, where he walks back through the past 60 years of American history and asks, should we be compensating African Americans for some of the things that the federal government has done and state and municipal governments have done? Um, it was a thoroughly reported story. Um, it's a likely candidate for a number of top awards this year. Um, it was an earth-shaking event at the Atlantic, um, and ta Coates, to even have the words reparations uttered on Morning Edition <laughs> at NPR, which reaches tens, uh, tens of millions of people every month, um, was a testament to the effect of the journalism that he'd done. But ta Coates started as a blogger at theatlantic.com. And he started doing stuff like this. This was back in 2009, in April 2009. He was like, you know, I'm kind of a history geek. I'm super interested in the Civil War. Hey, I'm reading this book, Capital Men, and it's really interesting. Um, he ended up, you know, readers responded. There were a few people that were like, yeah, I'd never read this book before. And you found some interesting stuff about the, the Civil War. I want to participate in this. I want to hear more of what you find on the Civil War. This is not conventional wisdom. Remember, in 2009, it is not, it, nobody thinks that you can go back to the 19th century when people are saying more news, more news, scoops, scoops, scoops. Nobody thinks that you can go back to the 19th century and suddenly decide you want to start reporting on the Civil War and reading books about the 18th century? No. Um, but he does. From every one of those little bullets in this list here is another post about ta Coates reading a book about the Civil War and exploring his findings or talking about something that's in the news that relates to how we think about the Civil War. That's, and these are just the posts from October 2008 to July 2009. From July 2009 to June 2010, Ta-Nehisi Coates goes deep. He gets obsessed with the Civil War. He starts discovering what it actually was. He's never read this history before, and watching him engage with it for the first time really is fascinating. It's a Electrifying. People want to join, jump, jump on board that trip. So it goes on like this for literal years where he is writing about his findings from excavating the history of the Civil War. A blogger, this list that you're seeing here is another, a reader of that process, um, just who pulled together a sort of table of contents of all of ta posts about the Civil War. I point this out because the internet sort of actually likes obsessions. This is a thing that we know that the internet can do. People kind of enjoy getting obsessed with things, whether it's bronies getting obsessed with My Little Pony, um, or whether it's uh, folks becoming obsessed with cereal, or whether it's someone becoming obsessed with the Civil War. I think that this is the internet's most precious renewable energy source, this willingness to discover alongside someone, this willing to in, willingness to indulge us in our deepest, most trenchant, most interesting curiosities, that is something miraculous that the media can do now, that we have the ability to do. As journalists, I think we have to learn how to wield this power. We have the opportunity to really dive deep into our curiosities and to discover things. Let us learn how to use it. Um, Last year, year before last, um, I worked with a young journalist at NPR named Kat Chow. Um, Kat's fascinating and fantastic. Um, like many of you, um, we were talking about 1963 and all the things that happened that year. The, um, the integration of the University of Alabama, um, the assassination of JFK, President John F. Kennedy, um, the March on Washington, um, all these things happened that year, and we were talking about how do we tell this story? How do we tell, how do we con convey what it felt like to have uh, one day the governor of Alabama, George Wallace, standing in the door of the University of Alabama while, uh, while two black students try to attend school there and saying, no, you can't come, um, and having them actually just start attending school there. Um, Having that happen in one afternoon in that very evening, hearing that the NAACP activist Medgar Evers had been assassinated, what did that feel like? What did that feel like, just living through that? Um, Kat had not, you know, Kat's a young, a young person. She, did not, she was not alive during 1963, and so she said, you know, 
I would be interested in actually going deep into what that felt like. I'm gonna do a Twitter account where I'm gonna try as closely as possible to match the events in 1963, the interesting things that were happening all through the year with the timing of tweets that I post on Twitter, as though we were tweeting about 1963 today, as though Twitter were alive back then and we were tweeting about it um, in real time. And so you saw tweets like marriages between whites and Negroes have increased recently in New York City in your feed. Supreme Court will review whether or not Alabama is allowed to keep the NAACP from operating within its borders. Governor Wallace, racial tension in Alabama must be solved by local people. There's been too much interference from DC in the first place. Film footage from today's Chicago public schools boycotts. These were the things that people were seeing in their feeds right alongside you know, the latest from Kim Kardashian and what have you. They were seeing Governor Wallace saying, uh-uh DC, don't mess with us. We're gonna keep our schools as segregated as we want to. Um, it was the response to it, um, to Kat discovering this history, Kat Chow discovering this history for the first time, the response to it was overwhelming. People saying, I never thought I'd say this about a Twitter stream, but today in 1963, tweets really make history feel vis visceral and alive. Uh, the speed at which everything happened in Dallas 50 years ago, that was on the anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy, the speed at which these events unfolded is unbelievable, it's chilling how quickly we suddenly had a new president because our president was gone. I think not only do people get to follow along with us in these journeys, not only can we, can we take advantage of folks um, being able to see us discover, they also facilitate the discovery increasingly. I talked about ta Coates. One of the things that he did as a blogger, I also talked about Ezra Klein and the, the rise of in one chart. One of the formats that ta invented was one that I kind of wish had always had taken off beyond him, because um, it was awesome, and he did it a number of times. It was called Talk to Me Like I'm Stupid, where he would invite his audience. He was curious. He said, you know, I want to know about, like, how many slaves worked in the U.S., um, at the height of the Atlantic slave trade. Um, I want to understand how like agrarianism related to Marxism and how all of that related to slavery. Like he, again, he went deep. Like these were not, um, talk to me like I'm stupid. I want to know about like empire. Is it a good show? Um, lock state of slavery and war. And he invited people to just tell him, tell him everything that they know, everything that they thought, bring him their questions, bring him the things that they learned, bring him the interesting books that they'd read um, as he tried to figure this out. This was the process, this process, reporting, diving back into the Civil War, this was the process that led to, ultimately, to the reporting that gave us the case for reparations. Um, and that discovery, watching alongside ta as he was wrestling with these things, was fascinating. It's the most compelling thing that journalists can do, and we have the opportunity now to do that in public. Um, the conceit does, the talk to me like I'm stupid thing does live on in one place. Um, there's a very popular subreddit, 4.4 million subscribers called Explain Like I'm Five, where people do the same thing. They're like, I don't understand. I don't understand derivatives, financial derivatives. Explain them like I'm five. Um, there's this notion of the curiosity gap. Um, I want to just, as a sort of cautionary note, um, state what I, I am not, advocating for, there's a sort of, so the curiosity gap was this idea, um, it's a very effective gimmick for making a headline work in social media, for making people wanna share something. Um, it is, um, you wanna get your headline exactly in the middle between something like, Mitt Romney says something bad again, and Mitt Romney says, I want the middle class to be tied to the roof of my car, which is too specific. Right, you, like after you've already had that quote in there, you don't need to, nobody needs to click. So the best headline is the Curiosity Gap headline. You will not believe what Mitt wants to do to you. That was the Curiosity Gap. Um, and it, it has to totally taken off. Like a lot of folks write headlines with the idea of like the Curiosity Gap. Like this one weird trick will eliminate all your be belly fat. Like that is a Curiosity Gap headline. Um, but Ultimately, that is a very, that is the sort of shallowest form of curiosity, right? Like, putatively, you solve your curiosity when you click on the headline and you learn the one weird trick that will eliminate all your belly fat. Um, 
That's not what I'm talking about here. I think that there is genuine curiosity that we can stoke as journalists, that we can do this. And this is one of the most powerful things that we can do, that we can actually incite curiosity, that we can make people deeply curious about things. Um, I think to the extent that I've, I've got a theory about it, you need three things. You need to develop a following. You need people or to have or to use a following of some sort. People who are familiar with you and how you work. You need curiosity. You need the genuine willingness to dive in. You need genuine passion about the topic that you want to pursue. And you need humility. You need to be humble about the limits of your own perceptions. You need to be open to, uh, to experiencing, understanding, empathizing with um, the perceptions of others. Um, you need to know, fundamentally, you don't know everything. As a matter of fact, none of us can even know very much. And the more we know, the more we know we don't know. And we need to figure out how to construct journalism around this process. We need to make this a thing that we do as journalists. The journey of discovery, making that the most compelling thing we possibly can, making people want to join along with us as we dive into the things that we are curious about. We need to figure out how to create genuine curiosity and then how to reward it with the work that we do. When I think about the mission of a center for collaborative journalism, this is what I think about. This is, I think, a grand opportunity that over the next few years, we are going to be figuring out how do we stoke curiosity? What is it in a headline or an image or a story structure? What is it that enables, that gets people really obsessed with the things that we are passionate about and want to know? How do we pull people along with us? This will enable us to tell larger stories, which I think is a fantastic thing for journalists to want to do. Again, thank you so much for joining me and for a <laughs> this and for allowing me to speak to you this, this afternoon. And um, please feel free to follow up with any questions that you have or any just comments that you want to tell me or thoughts that you want to share with me or stories that have been obsessing you recently. I look forward to talking to all of you. I'll be around for the rest of the afternoon. Best of luck, students, with your interviews this afternoon. Fascinate your interviewers. Make this as hard a choice for them as possible. And thank you. Thanks, everyone. And we have to rush, unfortunately, to the interviews for those of you who have 130s. Uh, but if you're not, have, if you don't have a 130 interview, feel free to mill around here or head over to the center, find an admissions person, they can give you a tour. And thanks again. <laughs>